Welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buholtz, and this is episode 65, the first five pages, an interview with Laura Drake, coming to you on Thursday, May 17th, 2018. Let me start real quick by giving you an update on my writing progress. I am always laughing whenever something like this happens to me. As soon as you know, you see it in children and we laugh, ha ha, children, they're so cute and funny, you know, just tell them they can't, they can't help you with the dishes and suddenly they want to help you with the dishes or they have to do this and suddenly they don't want to do it. And you can use this whole reverse psychology on them, ha ha, aren't they so cute? But (laughs) what makes me laugh way more is when we do it to ourselves and find that it works inside our own heads without us even trying to. In fact, maybe even when we're specifically really not trying to make this happen. So I told you that I was still like a little too tired, too stressed to be thinking about putting creative words and thoughts together. Um, I did some writing on Monday and then I was like, okay, this is um, still, I I just need some break time. I need some get my joy back time. And so (laughs) since then I've been like, Hmm. Well, now that I don't have to write, I, I mean, literally not even thinking that it's just that Now that I, in my subconscious, am not telling myself, you have to write for an hour today, or you have to write X number of words today, well, now I'm like, you know, I would love to just like go down to this place that sells um, bakery items and treat myself to a baked good, but I will tell myself that I'll take my computer there and write something, anything, whatever, Um, just have fun, eat my chocolate croissant and have fun writing some silly thing. So it's funny how now I want to write, (laughs) even as I'm telling myself, it's okay, honey, you don't have to write, you're you're tired, just relax. Um, Apparently... I find writing relaxing (laughs) when I stop thinking of it as work. Go figure, right? So just something to keep in mind in case you're having some weird like cross connection, uh, reverse psychology stuff going on in your head with writing. Uh, Yeah, maybe we should try as hard as we can to stop thinking of it as work, even when it is our job. And, uh, and try to think of it more as play, something that we want to do because we have free time and we want to do it. I don't know. That's that's my update. I will keep you informed as to how things are going with my writing. I was going to say, or lack thereof, but there may not be much of a lack. Who knows? So in the meantime, while I'm figuring myself out, I have got some great guests lined up. Today, you are going to listen to Laura Drake, who is just fun, fun and interesting. She's got some really helpful stuff that she's going to share with us about making the first five pages better. Now, Laura is both traditionally published, she's an award-winning author, and she started self-publishing as well. So with a little bit of a foot in both camp, having worked with a editor at a professional, um, not to say anything else is necessarily unprofessional, but having worked with a, a professional editor whose job it is at a traditional New York publisher to make books as best as they can be for New York standards, and then also having uh, done it a slightly different way in self-publishing, uh, she's got some really interesting things to say about no matter what, you still have to make those first five pages sing. Oh, and one quick word of warning. I do want to let you know that Laura reads the beginning of of several books as examples. And one of those books is The Martian by Andy Weir. And there are several instances of the F word. So if you have small children around, you might want to wait and listen to this one on your own. So without further ado, let's get on with the interview. Hello, today's guest is novelist Laura Drake. Laura is a New York published author of women's fiction and romance. Her debut, The Sweet Spot, won the 2014 Romance Writers of America Rita Award. It's very prestigious. (laughs) She gave up the corporate CFO gig to write full-time. She's a wife, grandmother, and motorcycle chick in the remaining waking hours. Today, Laura is going to talk to us about writing the first five pages. Welcome, Laura. Thanks, Kitty. I'm so excited to be here. I've had tons Me too. of coffee. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Excellent. Well, then you should be able to get like an hour's worth of presentation in in 30 minutes if you've had... Get ready. I'm going to talk fast. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, great. So you have actually done this talk um, many times before, the first five pages. So I'm just going to let you get started. Great. Thanks. All right. Thanks. We are readers first, right? 
We know what it's like to pick up a book and get sucked into this fictional world that the author created and suspend disbelief and go on this journey with them. Those are the best books, aren't they? I, I love, love them. those books. Um, one that glues the reader to the page and they forget where they are and that they have to cook dinner and all of that fun stuff. But how do you do that? I have a theory. People don't come to a book necessarily for a story. They come for the characters, right? Think about your favorite books. I would think that the first thing you think about isn't the plot line. It's the characters. Yeah, that's totally I, me. Yeah. After all, Star Wars has a great plot. So does Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Hunger Games. But what would they be without look, Luke, Harry, Frodo, and Katniss? They'd be unsold, right? <laughs> okay, so how do you do that in your first couple of pages? It's critical. These are probably the most important pages in your book. You need to show the reader who the character is deep down right at the beginning because the reader has to care about the character in order to follow them on this journey you've created. Easiest way, I think, is to explain through movies because we've all read different books, but we've probably seen the same movies. Think about Katniss in The Hunger Games, that opening scene. What do you know right away? She's poor. She lives in a very bleak black and white world. She loves her family, even her mother, who it's clear she has no respect for, and that stupid orange cat that hates her guts, right? <laughs> right. But what does she do? She saves her sister from what is effectively a death sentence. I mean, you've got to love a character like that, right? How would you feel about that movie if Katniss went into the Hunger Games for the fame and fortune and everything that she got at the end? I wouldn't want to follow her through everything that movie put you through. So how do you show that character really well in the first couple pages and make the readers care? Done well, it looks easy, but it's not. The beginning of my Rita winner, The Sweet Spot, took me six months to write. Now, wow. I spent entire six months writing it, but as I wrote the book, I kept going back to the beginning and changing words and nuances, and the beginning is that important. So let me read it to you, the first page and a half. The grief counselor told the group to be grateful for what they had left. After lots of considering, Charla Ray decided she was grateful for the bull semen. <laughs> Charla Ray Denny wiped her hands on her apron and stepped back, surveying the shelves of her pantry. This month's good housekeeping suggested using scraps of linoleum as shelf paper. It had been a bitch kitty to cut, but cost nothing, would be easy to clean, and continued the white pebbled theme of her kitchen floor. And for a few hours... The project had rescued her weary mind from a hamster wheel of regret. The homing beacon in the Valium bottle next to the sink tugged at her insides. She sipped a glass of water to avoid reaching for it and glanced out the window at the spring skeletal trees of the backyard. Her gaze returned to the two-foot-wide stump, the way a tongue wanders to a missing tooth. Tentative grass shoots had sprung up to obscure the obscene scar in the soil. She hadn't thought that an innocent tree could kill a child. She hadn't thought an innocent co-ed could kill a marriage. And if those pills could kill the thinking, she'd take ten. At the familiar throaty growl of a Peterbilt turning off the road out front, Char jerked, realizing minutes had passed. She'd been listening for that deep throb for hours. She always did. As the cab and empty cattle hauler swept by the window, she wound her shaking hands in her apron as if her, the sturdy cotton would hold her together. 
A ranch wife could stretch a pound of hamburger farther than anyone, but daddy's new medicine cost the moon, and the bills in the basket beside the computer were piling up like snowdrifts in a blizzard. Hands still shaking, she untied the bib apron and pulled it over her head. She'd rather clean bathrooms at the airport than ask her ex for money, but then most of her choices these days were like that. Okay. Three, thank you for hanging in with me. And I only use my book because I know it the best. <laughs> yeah. You, you just remind me of how much I loved reading those first couple of pages of your book, oh, particularly you. because at first it grabs me with humor, which for me is the way to grab me. And then the pathos and the emotion. Woo. Okay. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll go into that a little bit later because I broke a rule with that first line, but I didn't mean to. Ah. Okay, so that's 359 words, about a page and a half. What do we learn about the protagonist in that page and a half? She's divorced. She's an old-fashioned girl, the, the bibbed apron. Um, she's, her husband had an affair. They lost a child, and a tree had something to do with it. She's broke. Her father's sick. She has a slight plot problem with Valium. Okay, so do you empathize with this character? Do you want to read on to know more? God, I hope so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> do you see how instead of throwing a whole bunch of backstory in, it only hints that there is backstory and raises questions in the reader's mind? That's what you want to do. That's will, what will suck them into your world and keep turning pages. So it doesn't mean you can't start with an action scene, a car crash, a problem, something like that. But sometime in the first scene, you've got to give us a hint about the character, who he is, what he wants, and why we should care. Okay. There's a couple of ways to start a book, and I named them because I don't know that they have names, or if they do, I don't know what they are. <laughs> okay. I call soft beginnings, which is begins with description, quiet times, reflection. The passage I just read was a soft beginning. It can be a hard beginning, the car crash, um, in media res, beginning in the middle, throwing the reader into the action. But still, I'd make the point that you need to tell us why we care. Car crashes, when you're driving on a road, you have to look. But how much more does it mean if you recognize someone in that car crash? Right. That's what I'm saying. Then there's what I call movie beginnings. I call it that because you see it all the time in movies. A short scene that shows the character in their normal life before something happens. Hunger Games is like that. Katniss's life before anything else happens. And they're very popular and they work well in books too. None of these are right or wrong. I've used them all. Your story dictates which one to use which one works for you the best. But the main thing is start the story as late as you possibly can. So even if you're starting with description, and even if description is a character, the setting itself is a character, you still have to get to a human or an alien as fast <laughs> as possible, depending on what you're writing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Opening lines. They are very important. It's like Stephen King says, an opening line should say, listen, come in here. You want to know about this, <laughs> right? It should intrigue you to read on. And there's a bunch of ways to do that. First one is humor. And you pointed it out in my book. Honest to God, I did not mean that line to be funny. But when I read it for the first time, you know uh, Tessa Dare personally. Right. We were at a retreat in Big Bear, and it was the first time I'd ever read it out loud. She snorted wine through her nose. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> they thought it was, they fell out laughing, and I'm like, what? Because bull semen is very important in the industry. They 
breed bulls to buck just like you breed a thoroughbred to run. So, I mean, I was very serious about this. So, really, my first line broke a, uh, a rule because your first line, if your book is emotional, which this one is, your first line should be emotional. And apparently it wasn't. Um, it's a, your first line is a promise to the reader about what kind of story they can expect. You know, I did break the rule, didn't mean to, but I don't mind because I'll be at a conference and someone will, in an elevator somewhere, somebody will read my name tag and go, oh, you're the bull semen lady. Right. <laughs> and you know what? I don't care as long as they remember the book, right? Right. <laughs> you can use irony, a contradiction or an opposite of some kind, something unexpected a restaurant with no food, a fashion model pigging out, something like that. I've got an example. There was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. It's from the voyage <laughs> of John Treader from C.S. Lewis. It could be a catalyst, something that sets your uh, story in motion, like a car crash or something like that. Um, my example is when the doorbell rings at three in the morning, it's never good news. Stormbreaker by Anthony Horowitz. It could be a question, although they were so overused for the longest time, you don't see them much anymore. Um, and my example shows you that. True, nervous, very, very nervous I had been and am, but why will you say that I am mad? Edgar Allan Poe, The Telltale Heart. Ah, uh, yeah. An old book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a comparison, a simile or a metaphor. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Tale of Two Cities, uh, Charles Dickens. A dilemma. And pardon my language, I did not write this. Although I wish I had. <laughs> I'm pretty much fucked. That's my considered opinion. Fucked. Six days into what should be the greatest two months of my life, and it's turned into a nightmare. The Martian, Andy Weir. As soon as you started reading, I'm like, I know what book that is. <laughs> <laughs> I love that book. I love the book and the movie equally. I don't know. I can't decide which one I like the best. Well, the movie's got to be better because of, is it Matt Damon that's in it? Matt Damon. Oh, he's brilliant in the, as that character. I know, right? And, you know, slightly hot. <laughs> it could be an intriguing character. Um, my example, and you'll get this one too. If you really want to hear about it, the very first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born and what my lousy childhood was like and how my parents were occupied and all before they had me and all that David Copperfield kind of crap. But I don't feel like going into it if you really want to know the truth. Catcher in the Rye, J.D. Salinger. You could make a point or use high concept. And I know high concept sounds all MFA and everybody gets wigged <laughs> out about it. But really, it's just a plot that can be described succinctly in an appealing way. A kid wins a golden ticket to a mysterious candy factory. Charlie, right. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, yeah. yeah that's right. Wizard School. Uh, see, and then I would just wanted to say Hogwarts, Harry Potter. Harry Potter. <laughs> um, you can make a point with your first sentence of what your story is going to explore. I know you'll know this one, too. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Pride, Pride, Pride. and Prejudice. Jane unless, yeah, I was going to say, unless it's Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, which I'm really into right now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm not going to go into uh, your first page's uh, point of view is important. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail about it. You can Google it. There is a ton of information out there about it. But the only thing I'll say about it is that nowadays people want a closer POV. Yeah. Thank God for YA. 
they had the guts to get out there and use first person. First person is much more popular nowadays. You don't have to use first person, you can use third person close uh, right. POV. And I believe it's because of all the media we have available, movies and TV and Netflix and, and Hulu. And you want an immersive experience. The reader doesn't want to read about a character. They want to get into a character's skin and be that character and go on an adventure. And close POV will do that better than other uh, methods. Okay, the dreaded backstory discussion. <laughs> Backstory gets a bad rep. And honestly, it isn't the backstory. It's the fact that authors don't do it well very often. Right. If we saw backstory as we do in real life, instead of mechanically, I think it would be much easier to handle. So what's the difference? This is what we see in real life. A seven-year-old girl sits watching a beauty pageant intently. She's big for her age and slightly plump. She has frizzy hair and wears black rimmed glasses. She studies the show earnestly. Then, using a remote, she freezes the image. Absently, she holds up one hand and mimics the waving style of Miss America. She rewinds and starts all over again. <laughs> Powerful, right? Yeah. One paragraph and you understand what this girl wants and why she can't have it. Yeah. So you see, what's important about backstory isn't what happened to the character. It's what they took away from it. Think of it like backstory is your prescription in your glasses. It's how you see the world. I have a prescription. You have yours. Your character has theirs. Um, so everything that they see, you and I can see the same thing but we may react to it very differently. Right. The key to backstory isn't mechanical. It's visceral. And I got a perfect example. Clowns. Oh, uh, yeah. I loved clowns as a kid. They are funny and they exist only to make kids laugh. But I know a lot of people don't feel that way about clowns. <laughs> Right. And that was even before Stephen King's It movie came out <laughs> or the book. I'm still not over the trauma of the book. Yeah. <laughs> so visceral, not mechanical. Okay. So have you ever been at a cocktail party or some kind of get together and you somehow get right next to this guy that tells you your, his entire life story in his first five minutes? Yes. I make the case that if you put backstory in the first three chapters, you are that guy. <laughs> yeah. Don't be that guy. Nice. Okay, so how do you do it? I'm going to use one of my very favorite films of all time and, to illustrate, and I think every author should see this movie and study it for how it was written, and especially for its use of backstory. Goodwill Hunting. Oh, yeah. Love that movie. Um, in my opinion, it's like the best. Okay, so we start out and we meet this blue collar ruffian who's got a crappy job. He's a janitor, but he's a janitor at Harvard. And he stops in the very first scene mopping a floor to solve this humongous theoretical math problem on the wall. How can you not know, want to know more about this guy? Exactly. Right? Okay, so we know Will has anger issues. He's in therapy for it the whole movie. But when do we find out what they are? It's near the very end, and they don't give you a flashback to it. It's five lines screamed in an argument with his girlfriend, and it raised the hair on my arms. Remember... It's often better to let not tell the backstory, just hint at it, then let it explode on the page. Yeah. The reader had, you're, you're never going to be able to write that scene as well as the reader's going to have it in their head, right? 
Right. That movie never burdened you with the backstory. And yet it was a whole substructure of the plot of the movie. By the time you discovered the backstory, you were dying to know it. That is fantastic storytelling. And that's what you want to do. Okay. Few important things to remember in your opening. And I see all these in published books. I'll say that right out front because you're going to go, wait. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Don't introduce too many characters in the first scene. It's confusing to the reader and they don't know who's important. Set the scene. Remember, the reader comes cold to the page. They don't know where they are, what world they're in. Is it the 19th century? Are they in the future? They have no idea. So you need to set the scene. Character, tension, conflict. Again, think of it as who is the character, what do they want, and why can't they have it? Dumps any of any kind. Description, backstory, setting, be careful with it. Remember, the reader needs to know a lot less than you think they do. Think of yourself as a reader. When you open a book and you're reading the first couple of pages, you're not only reading the words, you're analyzing every single word to pick up details and hints about what's going on in the character and what might happen on the next page. Right. So the reader gets it much faster than you think you, they do. So be careful with that. Um, I am going to make available for your podcast readers a opening checklist that I use. I use it on every book that I do when I'm done before I turn in the book, I check to be sure I've covered every point. And it also works for chapter beginnings and things like that. So all you need to do is email me at my website, lauradrakebooks.com, and I will send it to you. Excellent. And we'll put a link in the show notes. Thank you. How generous. Thanks, Laura. Of course. I keep it right next to my Ah, computer. Got it in a little thing so it doesn't fall apart. Yeah. uh, It's really helpful. So if you want that, let me know. Awesome. That's it. That is brilliant. But, you know, I'll show up. (laughs) <laughs> you and I could talk for a long, long time about writing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. So let's just, um, real briefly, let's go over a couple of questions that people might have. Um, you are primarily traditionally published, right? Yes. I okay. have uh, self-published one book and a novella, which okay. I love doing, by the way. God, isn't it great? I do love it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, so tell us a little bit about your experience with the first five pages um, when it comes to the the years of querying. Um, I, I know a little bit more about your backstory. Uh, the years of querying through um, knowing that you have a contract and still having somebody maybe tell you to change things in the beginning versus is there anything different about it, the way that you're doing that versus um, knowing that you're self-publishing the story that you're, you know, working on now? So um, New York publishing is like going to school. You have a test at the end and somebody (laughs) can tell you if it's right or wrong. (laughs) Self-publishing is playing. You have no teacher around to tell you what you're doing wrong. It's like art class, right? Nobody can tell you it doesn't look good. Um, (laughs) Now there's advantages and disadvantages to that. I mean, it's a joy to write, but not having the editing in a second. Of course, I have critters, critique partners, but still, you know, the editor is like God telling you it's okay, that you be (laughs) good. So there are advantages and disadvantages to both. And and can I guess that a lot of your list came from um, the years of querying and then publishing with traditional publishers? I'm sorry, what list? Uh, your your list that you're giving us on um, the beginnings, the oh, opening. The, mm-hmm. Yeah, the opening checklist. Yes, yeah. exactly. It's and and actually 
creating this, uh, I, I teach a class in the first five pages where we edit their first five pages. Ah. You, you see a lot of the same things over and over and over again. And, and I'm guilty of the same one. So, you know, I'm not yeah. I'm talking out of school here. <laughs> but isn't that how, you know, people came up with the phrase that good writing is rewriting? <laughs> exactly right. Although I try to do as little of that as possible because I hate it editing. <laughs> I love the writing, hate the editing. Oh yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Wow. This is really great stuff. So I, I would, I usually ask people, is there, um, you know, any particular takeaway that you want listeners to really think about after listening, but I'm like, you're going to have this great checklist. <laughs> and if you haven't seen Goodwill Hunting, or even if you've seen it, go back as a writer and analyze it. It's incredible. I, I have to say, I was trying to uh, surreptitiously write with my left hand on a piece of paper while still looking like I'm totally paying attention to you. <laughs> so it says DWH here on the side of my paper. <laughs> Absolutely. Because I don't think I've seen it since maybe uh, th- within the first year that it came out. I think that's the only Matt time. Matt Damon wrote it. Matt Damon. I do remember that. Somebody and, um, wrote it. Um, wasn't Robin Williams. It was. No, uh, Daredevil. Um, <laughs> I don't oh my gosh. Thing, so I Sorry, uh, Deadpool and the old Daredevil. Uh, <laughs> this I is so embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, yes, they were uh, writing partners and, uh, and wrote it together. I wish they'd write more because it was amazing. It was so good. And that's pretty much the story that got them both kind of discovered by, you know, yep. the A-list people. So yep. that's what we all hope for. Well, the, and the sweet spot for you was, I mean, that was an amazing debut. You know, it won, it, wasn't it best book of the year? Yeah, the, be- yeah, the best debut. Best day. debut. Okay. Yeah. Um, which is amazing. Uh, it was the highlight of my life. Yeah. But don't tell my husband because he thinks he is. Right. Right. Well, you know, if it wasn't for him, you probably wouldn't have love stories on your brain. So That's very true. Very <laughs> true. <laughs> Excellent. Laura, this is great stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Okay. So what we need to do is be thinking about, I'm just kind of doing a little summary inside my own head. What we're supposed to be doing is um, we're writing all the way through, but as we think of ways to make the beginning better, like depending on whether or not you're the kind of writer who has to wait until you get to the end and then you edit or whether you edit as you go along. So using your own personality, either taking notes or actually going back to that beginning and finding ways to like, you had an idea of a way to bring it up a notch, bring it up a notch, bring it up a notch. Exactly. Exactly. Tighten and amp it. The whole time I'm writing a book, I'm, I'm still got part of my mind thinking about that beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, listen, I have so many ideas for other things that I would like to talk to you. Almost all of my, my guests there. I'm like, okay, yeah. <laughs> so so uh, we'll get you on again later and um, talk about some of the other things that you are known to uh, be a good teacher on. Now, tell us a little bit about you, your books. Um, you're going to be teaching somewhere in just a couple of months, same place as me. Uh, let's uh, give the listeners a little idea of where they can find you. Okay. Uh, the best place to find everything is my website, lauradrakebooks.com. I do five to seven minute uh, write stuff videos where I choose a subject to talk about. Um, and it's either craft or motivation. Uh, I also teach online classes and my schedule is there. And then of course I do teach in person going to teach at RWA in Denver this year. I'm very excited. Yay. Um, the other thing I'm going to do this year, I'm probably nuts, but wouldn't be the first time, is run for the national Nationals treasurer position for RWA. So Excellent. vote for me and vote often. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I, I can attest that you certainly have the skills and background for it. So well, thank you. Um, You can follow me on Facebook for beauty pictures, coffee means and positivity. I feel like we can get enough negativity everywhere else. 
and it's so just true. Laura Drake on Facebook. And I'm very excited. The first book in my Chestnut Creek series is coming out in December. It's called The Last True Cowboy. Oh. Another I'm series from Grand Central. I'm very excited about it. Nice. Okay. The Last True Cowboy, Laura Drake, December. You got it. It's available awesome. now for pre-order, however, and pre-orders oh. help authors. All right. Yes, that's true. That's a big help. Wow. They really are believing in this book. That's an eight-month pre-order. That's Let's exciting. Hope I live up to it. <laughs> that's right. Well, who could not want to at least look at a book called The Last Cowboy? <laughs> the Last True Cowboy, and you the get the name, the title when you read it. Oh, it's, I love this hero. Oh. Uh, yay. Yay. Awesome. Laura, thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. You, Kitty, I appreciate it. Now I'm <laughs> going to get another cup of coffee. That's right, because what you need is to talk even faster, right? <laughs> <laughs> See you later, Kitty. Bye. Bye.